Today I wanna to share with you what I call the Busy Mother's Sourdough. And this is for all of you who have written to me in email or comments and shared your frustrations with trying to get a sourdough starter going and then trying to make sourdough bread and having it all just become a bit of a disaster. Either you can't get your sourdough starter going or you think you've got it going and you try to bake bread with it and your sourdough bread doesn't rise, it doesn't come out well, and you're just ready to give up. Well, don't give up because I've got a little tip here for you that's going to change everything. And even if you're not a busy mother but you've struggled with sourdough, this is for all of you. Hi sweet friends! I'm Mary and welcome to Mary's Nest where I teach traditional cooking skills for making nutrient-dense foods like bone broth, ferments, sourdough, and more. So if you enjoy learning about those things, consider subscribing to my channel. And don't forget to click on the little notification bell below. That'll let you know every time I upload a new video. Now I can't take credit for this very clever idea. This was developed by a girlfriend of mine many years ago. We were homeschool mothers together and she was definitely a busy mother. She had six children, but she really was very devoted to making the transition from a processed foods kitchen to a traditional foods kitchen. And she wanted to be able to incorporate sourdough bread into her family's diet. But so many times she'd try to start the starter and it wouldn't work out or she'd forget to feed it or she'd finally get it going and put it, uh, you know, get ready to make her bread and have her dough. And then she would get distracted because she had to take her kids somewhere or do this, that or the other thing. And then the dough would overrise and sink. It was always one problem after another. But then she got an idea. She came across a book which at the time was new, but now there have been many versions of this book. And it was the book uh, Bread in Five Minutes a Day. But she thought, what if I make the dough as is described in that book, which we're going to go over today, but instead of using so much yeast, I use just a very tiny little pinch of yeast. And then I put everything in the refrigerator and let's see what happens. Well, that's what we're going to do today, and we're going to see what happens. Well, what my friend theorized was could she mix all of this together, put it in a plastic container, and then not worry about it and just put it in her refrigerator, and then when she had the time to bake bread, take it out, take out as much as she wanted to make a loaf or a couple of rolls, whatever the case may be, give them time to rise, bake them, and be done with it. Not have to worry uh, about scheduling everything so perfectly about the rise, you know, the mixing and the rising and then the punching down and the rising and so on and so forth. And what she learned was that in fact, yes, you could do that. And this was all outlined in the book, uh, Bread in Five Minutes a Day. But she wanted to take this one step further and experiment. What if she put three and a half cups of flour, a cup and a half of water, these other ingredients, the salt, the sugar, and a little bit of yeast in here, let it rise in the fridge, pulled it out to bake, and took three cups of the dough, or a little more, whatever the case may be, to make her loaf of bread, and left enough in her little bin that was maybe equal to about a half a cup. And with that half a cup, she then went and added three cups of flour and one cup of water and maybe a pinch of sugar and a pinch of salt. No more yeast though. Mixed it all up with that little bit of dough ball that she had left in there and put that in the fridge. Would that be enough to allow the next set of dough be able to be turned into, into a, a nice loaf of bread? And what she discovered was yes, it was sufficient. And then she further theorized that over time, it slowly took on yeasts that were just in the air in her kitchen and became her busy mother's sourdough starter. Because she never added any more yeast, she just fed it once a week with more flour and water, giving her some dough, 
uh, ready to bake bread or rolls or whatever the case may be. She went on to double the recipe often in a bigger container, never adding any more yeast. Just leaving that about half a cup of dough in there, scraping down the dried sides on her container, uh, leaving the lid off while she'd be working in the kitchen, hoping some natural yeast would be coming in there. And what she found over time, the taste of her bread started to mature, the texture started to mature, it looked more like sourdough, tasted more like sourdough. So as far as she was concerned, it was sourdough. And I think that this can be a wonderful solution if you have been struggling with trying to make a sourdough starter or sourdough bread. Well, to try this method, what you're gonna need is some flour. It can be all-purpose flour or it can be bread flour. But I really recommend just starting with plain flour, not a whole grain flour. In future videos, we'll talk about how to transition this and do this with whole grain flours. But just to get this going, I highly recommend you use something just very simple and plain. Next, you're gonna need a teaspoon and a half of salt. I've just got a plain fine ground sea salt here, but use whatever you have. And then I've got a tablespoon of sugar. This is an organic unbleached sugar, but again, use whatever you have in your kitchen. And if you have made the transition uh, to a traditional foods kitchen and you are incorporating whole sugars uh, into your diet, you can certainly use the dried cane juice uh, known by the name Sucanat or anything along those lines. Maple sugar will work, uh, date sugar would work, uh, any, any type of sweetener, you just need a little something. And then you're just gonna want a quarter of a teaspoon of yeast. And this can be active dry yeast or instant yeast, it doesn't matter. And next you're gonna need about a cup and a half of water. And this can just be plain tap water, don't worry about it being hot uh, or cold, it it's doesn't matter, room temperature's fine. And you're gonna need one more thing, and that's some type of container. This is just a plastic food grade Rubbermaid container, and I like using these type because they're easy to put in my refrigerator, and we're gonna be putting all of this into our refrigerator. But if you have a flat plastic container, again, that's food safe, that's fine, or a glass container, that's fine too, whatever you wanna work with. It just needs to be large enough to hold three and a half cups of flour and one and a half cups of water and room to stir it all together, and it has to have some kind of cover on it. Now, the first thing that we're gonna do is to our water, we're just gonna go ahead and add in our sugar, and then we're gonna go ahead and add in our yeast. And don't worry if it's just room temperature, it doesn't need to be so warm. We just need to mix that up before we go ahead and add it into our little bucket here. Now I'm using active dry yeast. If you're using instant yeast, you can go ahead and put everything into your container in one fell swoop. You can add in your flour, your salt, your sugar, your instant yeast, give it a real good mixing, and then add in your water. But since I'm using active dry yeast, I'm gonna dissolve it first in water with a little sugar. And if, if you want a discussion of the differences between instant yeast and active dry yeast, I cover that in another video, and I'll be sure to link to that. So if you wanna watch, and I'll put the timestamp in so you can watch that discussion, but all you need to know is you can use either or here. Now I'm just using the little plastic measuring cup that came with my flour container, and this is very forgiving, so don't worry. You don't need to be super exact, but I'm just gonna go ahead and measure out my three cups. We're gonna put a total of three and a half cups in here. And then that's just my final half cup of flour. Then we'll go ahead and get our salt in there. And we'll just give this a real good whisk around just to make sure we get that salt very well distributed throughout the flour. And I just wanna mention, I'm not worried, I just wanted to mix this yeast throughout the water with the sugar, but I'm really not worried about the whole blooming process. My yeast is um, well within its expiration date, and the only reason that I'm mixing it with the water is to just make sure that it's well distributed since it is an active dry yeast. I just wanna get the little bit out of the bottom there, because I know many of you have told me that you really don't even worry about blooming or mixing your 
active dry yeast with water if you know that it's well within the expiration date. Uh, you use it very similar to the way you do instant yeast and you just throw it right in. So that definitely is an option if you're comfortable doing that. Then I'm going to take a wooden spoon and I'm just going to start mixing this right in the container. Now, you want this to be very wet and shaggy. The wetter the dough, the better. So if you feel that it's too dry, by all means, add more water. Now the consistency of the dough that you're looking for should be very wet and shaggy like this. And I'm going to take a, a close-up video so that you can see what this dough is like. Very wet like that. See how that's just fallen right off the spoon. Then just clean off any extra dough that's on your spoon and get that down into your container. A little bit of a sticky wicket, <laughs> but I don't like to waste anything. And then we'll go ahead and move on to the next step. Next, all we need to do is put our lid on, and it doesn't need to be super tight. This doesn't need to be an airtight container, nothing like that. Even in this case, I'm just going to kind of leave this corner a little loose there. And now I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to put this in my refrigerator. And I'm just going to leave it there for a day, day or two, and then I'll bring it out, I'll show you how the dough looks, and we'll proceed with making bread, and then we'll try to make another uh, batch of dough to put in the fridge. And then over time, I'll follow up with future videos showing how the texture and the taste of the bread changes over time to being more of a, a true sourdough. Well, I left this in my refrigerator for two days, and I am so impressed with all the beautiful bubbles that have formed in this dough, and I'll take pictures and I'll overlay them uh, from the front and the side here. Beautiful bubbles, and it's amazing just from that little tiny bit of yeast. And the aroma is quite lovely, not the least bit heavily yeasty or over yeasty. It's just a very, very mild aroma. Well, now let's take out about three cups worth and we'll make a loaf of bread. The first thing I'm going to do is just flour my board, but very lightly. I don't think we want to get too much flour into this dough because we do want to keep it very wet because apparently keeping it very wet is what really helps make a lot of that carbon dioxide gas, which is what creates all those wonderful bubbles. And hopefully now having a little bit of flour on my hands will make getting this out a little easier. So as you'll see, this is very wet and gloopy. Now what I did was I kept scissors handy just in case I had trouble pulling off that little bit that I want to leave left in there. And that's actually, it's not quite a cup. I'm going to add a little more. But I think my friend was never particularly uh, super exact about it. She would just leave maybe somewhere between the size of a golf ball and a baseball. So maybe a half a cup, a cup. She wasn't really exact about it, which is kind of what I really like about this. Now it's very wet and gooey, but you should be able to pull your hand off of it. There'll be some, some dough that'll stick, but it's really not too bad. So let's try and just shape this. The nice thing is, this is no need. <laughs> so all we need to do is just get enough flour on our hands to just do the tuck and shape uh, method, so to speak, where we're just going to shape this into a ball. Now what can really help with this process is having a little plastic bench scrape like this, or if you don't have it, don't worry, a spatula, if you have a little plastic spatula, that'll work well too. But I'm just trying to get a little more flour on my hands here, but not overdo it, and scoop it out like that, <laughs> and just try to shape this, just that little shape and tuck method. <laughs> it's quite sticky. <laughs> I'm resisting the urge to put too much flour, but I just keep flouring my hands and trying to tuck this little ball under. 
without picking it up. <laughs> it seems like when you pick it up, it's just a little too, uh, little too uh, wet. But doing like this is working well. And I just want to get it into a nice smooth bowl. Now, one thing I want to mention, if you have a pizza peel and a baking stone, you can do what I just did right now on my board on your pizza peel. And then when we get ready to bake this, you can just shake it off your pizza peel and put it into a, right onto your baking stone. But I know a lot of folks may not have a pizza peel and a baking stone. So the other options are you can just take a baking sheet, put down some parchment paper or aluminum foil, whatever you want, or you could even just bake it right on uh, your baking sheet. But what you want to make sure that you do is put down a little cornmeal or a little flour so nothing sticks. And then you can use that to bake it with. Another option is you can go ahead and do the Dutch oven method with this bread. You can put it on parchment paper and lower it down into your hot uh, Dutch oven and bake it with the cover on and bake it that way. Uh, or if you want, you can just plop it right down into your hot Dutch oven. Some of you have asked me, do you really need to use the parchment paper? And the answer is no. Uh, the original method of that Dutch oven bread uh, by Sullivan Street Bakery, they didn't use the parchment paper. They were just dumping it right into uh, the, the hot uh, Dutch oven. Uh, the parchment paper is really basically, I don't want to say invented, but started primarily by home cooks who were a little nervous having to get, the, uh, get their dough and drop it down into that hot uh, Dutch oven. So, but you can do it either way. And, but I thought that the easiest way would be to do this on the baking sheet because most folks have bake, have a baking sheet and if not you can take a couple of sheets of aluminum foil and sort of turn it into a mock baking sheet and bake it like that. So I've got my baking sheet over here and I've just got a piece of parchment paper on that and I'm just going to try to pick up my little dough ball here best I can <laughs> and get that onto there nicely shaped and now we're going to let that rise for about an hour. And my girlfriend never covered hers, so I'm just going to leave it uncovered. But if you feel more comfortable to cover it, uh, you could use a dish towel and just make sure that it's brushed with a little uh, flour uh, that, so it doesn't stick. Now, a couple of tips. Number one, I understand that you may not see a lot of rise out of your bread, but don't worry about that. It should get a little bit of rise, a little bit of what they call the oven spring when you put it into the oven. And speaking of the oven, you'll want to preheat your oven to 450 degrees Fahrenheit 20 minutes before you're ready to put your dough in. So as this is rising for that hour, 20 minutes before that hour comes to an end, be sure to preheat your oven to 450 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, I have a very small oven, so I tend to bake my breads in the lower third of my oven because if I put breads on the middle rack, they're actually very close to the top heating element and I find that they can brown too quickly. So that's just a little tip I want to share with you. If you have a very small oven like me, you may want to put your rack in the lower third of your oven. But if you have a big oven and you're used to baking breads and so on and so forth on your middle rack and everything comes out fine, then that's great. Now we come to the fun part. I have in here maybe about a half a cup of the dough and that's just what you want. You just want to have some in there to help give our next stage a nice boost. And what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and add in our three cups of flour. We're just going to do three cups because basically we've got more or less that half cup of dough in there. And this is my third cup of flour. Alrighty, so we've got that. And now I'm going to go ahead and add in one tablespoon of sugar, very much like we did the first time around. I'm going to do this just until I feel this gets established. Once I feel that I'm seeing a nice uh, rise in my container and a lot of nice bubbles, I'll pull back on the sugar and I'll just let the yeast that's growing in here uh, eat 
the flour, and uh, you'd get its nutrition from the flour, and no longer add in the sugar. Because sometimes if you add too much sugar, you can encourage the growth of good bacteria. Now that's not necessarily a bad thing, because both the yeast and good bacteria can rise your bread, but there are taste differences, as opposed to if you have the uh, natural yeast, which we're hoping to encourage to grow in here, uh, rise our bread versus the good bacteria. And this time around, I'm going to add just one teaspoon, not the one and a half teaspoons of salt. And the reason for that is since we do have about a half a cup or so of the dough uh, left in here, which has some salt in it, I don't want to add too much salt. So I'm just going to go ahead and put that one teaspoon in there. And then to start, I'm going to add about a half and a cup, or one and a half cups of water. And this is just plain room temperature water, and that's just about a cup and a half. We'll see how it goes. It may need more. Uh, if, it's, if it's very dry, we may need to add more water because you do want this to be a very wet dough. Uh, if for any reason we added too much water and it's too soupy, we can always add an extra flour. It's very forgiving. Now, if you have one of those Danish dough whisks, you can get in there and, and mix this up, or you can just use a wooden spoon. Or uh, if you watch uh, Artisan Bread with Steve, he always likes to use the handle of his wooden spoon, and I think that's gonna work best for this type of preparation. So I'm just gonna get in here and mix this best I can. Well, this is mixing up nicely, but it's a little drier than I would like. So I'm gonna go ahead and just add a smidge more water just maybe about a quarter of a cup or less. And I'll continue mixing it till I get to the consistency that I like and I'll show you how it looks. Well, I think that little extra bit of water was perfect. And I'll overlay a video so that you can see. It's hard using just, it's hard scooping. It's easy mixing it with the handle of the wooden spoon, but it's a little hard scooping some out. But I wanna show you how wet this dough is. And I think that's perfect. Now I'm just going to clean off the handle of my spoon and then we'll put the lid on and we'll pop this in the refrigerator. So I'm going to put my lid on. Again, not airtight. I'm actually going to leave this little one on the end a little loose and I'm going to go ahead, put this back in my refrigerator uh, and we'll check on it in another day or two and we'll see if we got any bubbles and how things are going. And Maybe we'll make another loaf of bread and see if there's a significant difference between our first loaf. But the bottom line is with this bread, we're with this dough and with this method, hopefully over time, we are creating a sourdough, a sourdough starter, and one that may be a little easier than the ones where you've tried just doing flour and water on your counter and hoping for the best. We are cheating a little, starting off with a little bit of packaged yeast, but you know, sometimes uh, when you're on this continuum of w moving from a processed foods kitchen to a traditional foods kitchen, and there is a particular area of traditional foods that you're struggling with, uh, sometimes it's nice to get a little helping hand and maybe just start with a little bit of uh, packaged yeast, in our case, just a quarter of a teaspoon, and then over time, Hopefully, you've got a good sourdough starter going. Well, my oven just came up to 450 degrees Fahrenheit, so we'll get ready to put our dough, which has been rising for an hour, into the oven, and hopefully it'll come out great. Now, I just wanna give you one tip. If you're doing it like me, right here on a baking pan, but you wanna try to mimic the Dutch oven effect, the, the steam that is created by putting your bread into the Dutch oven, you can uh, take a little pan and put it on the lowest rack in your oven, an oven safe pan, and uh, fill it with some water. And you just some water, I've got my tea kettle over there. Just uh, some water uh, that you've warmed in your tea kettle and pour, as you open your oven, pour it into that pan. It'll start to create some steam. Then put your bread in on your rack, close your door and hope for the best. Well, I've got my bread in the oven and it's gonna bake for 30 minutes at 450 degrees Fahrenheit. Now you might wonder why I just put the bread in straight away as it was. I didn't slash the top. And the reason is I decided to just let it 
crack basically wherever it wants to give it the most rustic look. That's what my friend used to do. But if you have a lom, that's the little razor blade for cutting bread, or just a very sharp knife, you can certainly make some slashes in it with any design that you want and let it bake like that. And I also want to say that everyone's oven is slightly different. So even though technically we're going to bake the bread for 30 minutes, I highly recommend taking a little peek at your bread at about 25 minutes. And if it looks done, if the top is nice and golden brown and you take it out of the oven and when you tap it on the bottom it sounds hollow, you're good to go. Your bread is baked. However, if you find that it is browning on top but it, but it turns out to not sound hollow and you need to bake it a little longer but you feel that it's gotten already golden brown enough and you're worried about it getting too dark on top, you can just cover it with a little bit of an aluminum tent, aluminum foil tent and continue to allow it to bake for the uh, remaining five minutes so that the interior bakes but that the top doesn't get too brown. Well, this turned out to be a lovely loaf of bread. I had it in for 30 minutes. Now, it didn't split or anything, which is very interesting. And it did have some bubbles on top, right on top of the dough. And I noticed them when I was putting them in the oven. And I was thinking, hmm, maybe I should uh, just take a little toothpick and deflate some of them. But then I forgot. <laughs> But it turned out okay. I think they're going to be probably kind of a little fun and crunchy uh, on the top. Uh, but something that I want to mention is I did tent this with aluminum foil uh, part way through the baking because I checked it and I noticed and it was those little bubbles they were browning quite quickly. But also the loaf was browning relatively quickly. Now I have a very small oven and I did have it on the lower third uh, rack, but it still was browning, uh, browning quickly. So I might lower the temperature to 425 degrees Fahrenheit or maybe even 400 degrees Fahrenheit. I'm going to experiment with the next loaf we do and see how that comes out. But for now, I'm quite pleased, even with having to tent it. Uh, but I wanted to let you know about that so that if you do this, keep an eye on it. And uh, if you have a small oven, probably in a bigger oven, it won't be as much of a problem. Uh, but uh, I have like the smallest wall oven they make. <laughs> so just keep an eye on it. And you don't, wanna, you don't want it to burn on top. So uh, you may have to tent it. Well, this is still quite hot, but hopefully you can hear with the microphone. It's got a nice top to it and oh, the bottom sounds nice and hollow. So that's perfect. I'm going to transfer this now to a cooling rack. We'll let it cool completely, then we'll slice it. Well, I let this cool for a little bit, but it's still warm. I think it's hard to resist warm homemade bread. So we'll go ahead and, and slice into it. And I'm going to go right down the middle and then I'll open it up so we can see exactly uh, how the crumb came. Well, this looks quite lovely. It's very warm. <laughs> but I'm quite pleased. You figure for a quarter teaspoon of yeast and in the dough left in the fridge for a couple of days. Oh, it smells nice. I'll take some close-up shots so that you can see exactly what it looks like. You will see, yeah, these were the little uh, air bubbles that I talked about that I didn't pop before it went in, but yeah, that's okay. But I think it came quite lovely. Well, I'm going to cut a slice here and we'll give it a taste. Oh, I really love how soft the interior is. Mmm. <laughs> mmm. It's quite hot. <laughs> it's very tasty. I'm really pleased. Now, we've got our second batch of the Busy Mother Sourdough Starter in the fridge. I'm going to leave it in there for a couple of days and then we'll take it out and we'll see without having added any extra yeast if that little bit of dough that we left in there and then mixed in more flour and water and sugar and salt was able to rise and get some bubbles in there and then we'll bake one more loaf and we'll see how that comes.
Well, I left this second batch in the refrigerator for three days, and I'm very impressed with what I see. It's definitely risen. There's a lot of bubbles in here, and I'll overlay pictures, uh, close-up pictures, so that you can see this both from the front angle here as well as the side angle but it's loaded with bubbles. So that's definitely a good sign. Now I wanna see how the aroma is. Oh, it smells wonderful. Mildly yeasty, but definitely not overpowering. Definitely closer to when you have a nice sourdough as opposed to a heavily yeasted dough where you've used commercial yeast. I'm also going to take a picture of the top looking down into this so that you can see up close. Now I don't, I don't know how well it's going to show on the camera, but there are a lot of little bubbles on top and they're not super translucent. So it may be a little difficult to see, but there it's, it's very bubbly on top. It's like bubbles that are like little air pockets that are coming up. Now what I'm going to do today is I'm just going to flour my board and I'm going to take some of that dough out and make another loaf of bread. I won't walk you through all of that uh, since we did that earlier in the video, but I will show you what uh, the bread looks like at the end and we can compare and contrast at least with pictures from our first bread. And then in a future video, as I nurse this along and keep it going, uh, I'll, I'll see how it goes, uh, assuming that if it continues to stay like this and create nice breads, I'll definitely do a follow-up video, uh, you know, maybe like a month or so from now, so that we can do a true evaluation of this process. Well, I took out some of the dough and I shaped a little loaf and I left in maybe about a half a cup, a cup, it's hard to tell exactly, but I took a picture so you could see what's in here. And it was really wet. It was a really wet dough when I took it out. So I uh, floured my board and then I floured my hands real well and I used my bench scrape to get this uh, into uh, some semblance of a loaf. Uh, but it was, it was relatively easy to work with, but it is definitely a very wet shaggy dough. But not unlike you know some, a lot of your typical no needs. So now what we're going to do is just like we did last time, we're going to put uh, three cups of flour in here. And I'm still going to continue to add a bit of sugar. So I've got that one tablespoon of sugar. I'm going to sprinkle that in and then one teaspoon of salt. And then I'm going to take about a cup and a half of water. And this is just plain room temperature water. Then I'm going to take the handle of my wooden spoon and I'm just going to mix this up like we did last time. Well, I've got this all mixed up and I even use my bench scrape to try and scrape down a little bit of the dried dough from the side. And it's the same consistency as last time. I'll overlay a little video so hopefully you can see that. But yeah, it's just this same wet shaggy dough. Well, now this is all ready to go back into my fridge. And on the second batch, I had left it in the refrigerator for three days. So now on this third batch, I may let it go a week and see how it does and see if I can still bake a loaf of bread with it. So if someone was a very busy mother and they didn't get to it for a week, how would it be? That'll be interesting to see. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and put this in the fridge. Well, I've got the dough on my parchment lined baking sheet. Now I'm going to let it rise in a warm, cozy place. Then we'll bake it and I'll show you how it looks. Well, I baked up this bread and I've got to tell you, I'm really surprised. This was the second batch that we took out of the refrigerator that I had left in there from three days ago. And we added no more yeast that second time around. We just added the flour, the sugar, and the salt. And this got a pretty good rise. Now, I want to tell you that I preheated my oven to 450 degrees Fahrenheit, and then I went ahead and put the dough in. I had it on the lower uh, third of my oven where I like to bake my bread. And I forgot to lower it down to 425 because if you remember, I told you that it browned up a little too quickly 
And so for the next time I was going to lower it, uh, experiment and lower it to 425. Well, I forgot till it was in there for about 10 minutes. And what happened was this spot right here definitely got a little over browned. This is one of those bubbles. And so I quickly lowered my oven to 425 and tented my bread. So I just want to give you a heads up on all of this. As you're experimenting with this Busy Mother sourdough, uh, monitor it and, and learn your oven and learn how this bread bakes up in your oven uh, because you may find that it browns quicker than you expect it to. Well, now let's cut this down the middle and I'll show it to you. And then what I'll do is I'll get the picture from the last loaf we made, which was the very first loaf. And I'll try to put it side by side so that you can compare it to how this loaf looks and we'll see what direction we're moving in. Alrighty, here we go. Whoops. Let's... Oh my gosh, it looks great. Look at this. I'm really impressed. Well, I'll take some close-up pictures and I'll overlay them so that you can see this bread as is. And then what I'll do is I'll, as I said, I'll try to put it side by side with our original loaf. But when you consider this was baked with dough that had been in the refrigerator for three days and part of it was in for two days. So some of that dough was in the refrigerator for a total of five days. No extra yeast was added the second time around. I think it came pretty darn good. Well, this really turned out to be a lovely bread. It's very nice. It's tender. Let's give it a taste now. And you know, I'm thinking I'm going to experiment and I'm going to try doing this in a loaf pan. I'm going to try doing a lot of different things with this, maybe making rolls, maybe even try cinnamon rolls with this dough. I think it might turn out quite well. Well, let's give this a taste. Mmm. Mmm. Very good. It's tasty. <laughs> I'm impressed. Well, I look forward to sharing more with you about this Busy Mother's sourdough. And if you've been struggling with sourdough starter, I really hope you'll give it a try. I think you're going to be pleasantly surprised. And if you'd like to learn more about how to bake bread with yeast, without yeast, maybe with sourdough starter, if you're up for that, then be sure to click on this video over here where I show you how to make all kinds of different breads. And I'll see you over there in my Texas Hill Country kitchen. Love and God bless.